Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex, a compiler engineer at Intel. I used to work on graphics compiler for some time. Now I'm mostly focusing on OpenDP and offloading stuff. And today we're going to talk about Spiri backend in LVM. Uh, so let's start with a quick overview of Spiri and its ecosystem. So first of all, Spiri is, is a NIR and a portable binary format serving <clears throat> as a program interface for heterogeneous accelerators mostly. Spiri is, uh, is targeted by various languages and APIs. For example, OpenCL and Vulkan, both from 3D and compute side. Uh, Spirit core specification uh, is defined by Kronos Group, um, but vendors uh, usually introduce their own extensions for the functionality they consider missing in the core specification. Uh, in LVM ecosystem, Spirit is produced by Kronos Spirit to LLM translator, which is a tool being formally external to LLM project. And that may result in potential inconsistencies between what Clan produces and what the translator actually expects. So we want to <clears throat> we want to solve this problem with a native LVM backend targeting SpearV. Uh, let's talk a bit more. Why would we really need a proper LVM backend targeting SpearV? Um, many accelerators which consume SpearV have no native solutions. Uh, have no native solution bridging LVM or IM with SpearV. While other accelerators do, for example, like um, AMD and NVIDIA GPUs with their AMD GPUs and NVPTX uh, backend, respectively. Also, it would make MLIR to LLM translation sensible for more accelerators, as instead of generating SpearV binary directly from SpearV dialect uh, of MLIR, it would be possible to generate LLM IR from, from MLIR. And since, since that leverage its uh, whole optimization pipeline, while still being able to produce uh, the final Spiri binary. Uh, yeah, this is just this is just a simple example demonstrating a very small OpenCL kernel, its LVMIR counterpart, and the resulting Spiri. It's here just for illustration purposes. You don't need to read it, to, to read it all. I will focus on some specific parts of it later. Uh, so, what are the key aspects of our backend design? Uh, first of all, it is based on global ISIL framework, uh, which has a pretty clear structure, is mostly written in C++, and that's why, uh, in our opinion, it's much simpler than selection duck. That's why it doesn't, since it doesn't employ uh, table gen um, as much as selection duck based backends. And yes, that's why it's especially simple for backend newbies like we were when we started this project. Uh, moreover, SpurV is a virtual ISA, so most of the interest in backend stuff uh, is redundant for it and is effectively uh, disabled in our backend for like, things like scheduling or register allocation, they're just not needed for SpurV. And the thing that Nikolai had already mentioned during, the, during his keynote, by design SpurV is much more similar to LMIR than MIR. We really have some kind of semantic gap in there. And that's why there are some design properties of our backend that we had to introduce. First of all, uh, we use target-specific intrinsics pretty heavily. I will further describe what do we need them for. Uh, but still, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's a difference from some ordinary hardware-oriented backends. We generate those intrinsics with some of our <clears throat> pre-code gen passes. I mean, pre-code gen means that these passes uh, operate on LVMIR rather than MIR. Also, we had to introduce some global entrance tracking infrastructure. I will also talk about this uh, in a couple of slides. Hmm. And we also uh, use some C++ in our instruction selection patterns. Uh, we, we, want, we, won't, <coughs> we weren't able to cover all of the selection patterns with the uh, table gen. Uh, so one part of the aforementioned semantic gap is the scope differences. In SpurV, types, constants, and globals, and other stuff are uniquely defined in a single module section and are used across all the functions. Uh, on the contrary, constant, uh, and standard LVM types are not even explicitly defined in LVMIR with the specific instruction. They are not material there. In MIR, in MIR the constants and globals are materialized within a function, but uh, types are still mostly dropped. I mean, dropped, they are turned into LLTs, essentially losing uh, some viable information for SPIRV. But in our backend, we do not violate the, the, the properties. We just uh, track each instance uh, of a potentially global entity in a special map where each entity is mapped to its original LVMIR counterpart or some specific descriptor if uh, non LVM counterpart existed, for example, for some special open cell types which are not even defined in LVMIR. In LVMIR. And the actual uh, global hoisting and duplicates removal 
uh, happens at um, uh, happens later during the actual uh, code emission. Uh, yeah, this is the example I've shown before. Here you can see the evolution of the floating point type of float type and uh, floating point constant. So float is in yellow and the constant is in green. So you can see how it was how it looked like in the source of the kernel, how it looks like in the Levi-Meyer, and how it actually looks in the spear view. So we have this uh, global section before the function body, where uh, where this type, where this float type and the constant is uh, uniquely defined, and later used within the function body. Uh, another issue is the fact that LVM to MIR lowering uh, loses some critical information required by SPIRV. For example, for aggregates types, uh, gap instructions. Uh, the reason why it is actually bad for, uh, for SPIRV is that SPIRV by design is platform agnostic and no over-optimization is expected to happen. Uh, so our backend's intention is to produce uh, like true SPIRV in a sense how it is currently produced by the translator. We do not want to lose some, we do not want to lose any of the high-level information SPIRV has. It's, uh, it's by the pipeline design, it's up to the accelerator compiler to optimize it further. Uh, decide uh, to decide whether it needs to lower anything or not. So we bypass higher translator aggregates lowering mostly for open cell specific types because Clan seems to avoid generating aggregate loads and stores for the kernel court. It's usually just memcpi instructions for, for example, for uh, copying aggreg aggregates. And <clears throat> yeah, uh, in SPIRV, each value is effectively described by an unsigned integer ID and the result type. Uh, which is an operand of the instruction which actually produces that value. And that result type is, it's, itself is an ID produced by a type declaration instruction. That's why in our backend we, we needed to avoid uh, get to create VREX, uh, VREX return, return more than one virtual register. And this is essentially an example of uh, aggregate load, which uh, uh, after IR translation being split into multiple loads, and we didn't want, and we didn't want to to see that with our backend because, uh, yeah, as I said, it essentially loses some critical information for SPIRV. And we solved it by introducing some target target specific intrinsics, which obviously do not un undergo heavy lowering of IR translator. Here you can see the original IR, IR after preparing, where we actually inserted this uh, intrinsics and uh, how the IR looks after after IR translation, where we essentially still have pretty pretty. Pretty the same code. Uh, as I said, since LVM to MIL over and loses some, some critical information, one, of, one kind of that information is actually type information. Uh, and another side of the semantic gap I mentioned is how types are represented in SPIRV. Uh, SPIRV types are mostly similar to LVM IR types. So LLTs are not enough for us to, uh, to generate final SPIRV. Uh, so, for, for example, for simple types like integers and floating point types, we can deduce them back. For others, we can't. Then that's why we have a dedicated pre-code gen pass, which maps each value with a, uh, with a constant metadata, either zero or on the value of that LVM type, so that later, uh, after a translator, we could get that type information back. Similar thing actually happens for all entities being deduplicated, like constants, globals, and other stuff. Uh, and yeah, talking a bit about the future, well, having proper metadata support in machine area would really help us to resolve this issue in much more elegant way. We wouldn't need to introduce any of these uh, special intrinsics. Uh, so let's talk a bit more about instruction selection. So we're trying to use table gen patterns as much as possible, but as I said, we didn't manage to cover all of the instructions with them. And this is this is a simple example of uh, of how the type inf information intrinsics is folded into the final instruction here. Uh, the main instruction is uh, floating point negation. Then we have this assigned type information, which assigned the, the spear regenerated type to it. Uh, and uh, you see, as a, this this pattern is being is used to fold this instruction into the final the single op f nj instruction. Uh, yeah, and this assign type uh, pseudo, pseudo instructions is supported in uh, global SL, <coughs> global ICL selection patterns with by using this GI node equivalence stuff, which is really very helpful. 
And one, one, one more side of the gap between SpearV and MIR is registers presentation. Uh, since SpearV is a virtual ISA, it has an unlimited number of, of untyped registers. And as I said, every SpearV value and it's, uh, is an effectively a 32 bit integer ID. So it has nothing to do with the result type field, which is calculated separately from the original LVMIR. And but we didn't want to introduce any extra native casts because they would clash with the ones the original code has or create huge multi-class in table gen to cover all the possible type combinations. And that's why we introduced some pseudo casts which convert register of any type into, into uh, S32 one. And them being pseudo lets us painlessly remove them later after the selection. Uh, this is a complete example of floating point addition and one of its operand being loaded. So you can see the pseudo cast there, the sign type instruction after that. And essentially, it's going to be folded into a single, into a single load and a single uh, floating point addition after that. So talking about uh, this theory, um, types being global, uh, being global, and constants being global, and uh, the thing that we essentially need to deduplicate them. This example perfectly illustrates uh, the situation why we really need a separate machinery to achieve that in LVM, for example. Here we have two, one kernel and one function, one function being um, called from that kernel. And you know, from, from MIR point of view, we have two different, uh, two instances of the same, of the same type of, and the same constant from the SPIRV point of view. So we really need to deduplicate them uh, eventually because yeah, from <clears throat> in the very end, we only need one instance of each of this stuff. Uh, so we track them in a special map, as I already said, uh, where we map them to the original MIR counterpart and then insert into the global section only, only once at the emission stage, for example, for textual spear via TASM printer. Well, that's it from me. Now I'll pass the word to Nico. Thank you, Alex. Um, another challenge that we encountered while uh, developing the backend uh, are OPEC types. Uh, and OpenCL has a family of, of types, such as image or, or sampler type, which do not have a native representation LVMIR. So instead, they are really represented as pointers to uh, OPAC or empty structs. Uh, while most frontends, and this includes Clang, uh, provide these type declarations and, and pointers natively, there are other frontends and, and some LVM-based tools, some forks of the translator, which emit just I64 or I32 types and provide the actual type information in the uh, metadata among other OpenCL uh, kernel attributes. And this is a big prob problem in itself since uh, removing all the metadata uh, makes lowering actually impossible. Uh, there are also inconsistencies in how these types are represented in metadata between various frontends. Um, and even Clang's native solution based on those pointers to OPAC structs um, has a very limited usability in, in the LVMIR. Um, for instance, it is impossible to bitcast uh, to or from these pseudotypes and in some passes incorrectly perform uh, pointer to int conversion on them. And additionally, well, in you issue in the opac pointer mode, uh, the types need to be inferred by uh, parsing the mangled uh, function names, which well, unfortunately do not contain any information on return types. So our current solution uh, in the backend tries to remedy all of these uh, problems. So any type information in the metadata uh, is first actually translated into those new or existing OPAC structs. We're trying to track duplicates. Uh, their names are later parsed using uh, table gen records and the structs are uh, lowered into proper SPV types. Um, however, there's a potentially better solution uh, currently discussed uh, on Fabricator. Joshua proposed uh, to introduce a new OPEC type in LVMIR, and the new type would provide a single or a unified um, and more usable representation of OpenCL types and other types, OPEC types, eliminating the need for, uh, for complex parsing in the code gen and um, inferring, making inferring return or argument types uh, possible in the OPEC pointer mode. And the next problem is uh, that we face is actually lowering of the OpenCL, SPIRV, GLSL built-in calls. So Quank passes titanium mangled names to code gen. So practically each backend needs to first uh, demangle the strings, uh, look up the built-in names and 
provide uh, its own implementation for all the built-ins. So the initial mechanism for this in, in our backend was based on a huge switch a statement matching the demangled strings to over 30 functions implementing each built-in. And we quickly, re we quickly realized that uh, going this road for additional 600 built-ins would not be a, a good idea. So instead, we organized all the built-ins into 18 general groups. Uh, for instance, one group gathering all atomic built-ins and one group gathering all relational built-ins and provided a single general implementation function for each group. So this way, all the actual implementation details are separated for, from lowering logic and defined in table gen records. Since the groups are API agnostic, often adding support just for a new built-in is just a matter of adding a single line in table gen with built-in name, uh, group name or argument requirements, and this targets pure v opcode. And though, although the current uh, built-in lowering mechanism is complete, we are working on, on something different, on a different solution. Instead of parsing uh, the built-ins in the backend, uh, Clan could, could link the compiled IR module with, with, an, with a library, IR, IR library, providing built-in function definitions. And those definitions would be based either on regular LVM instructions, when possible, or um, LVM intrinsics. And well, of course, the intrinsics will need to be fairly general and cover a group of functions. We, will. we cannot have thousands of intrinsics. So this way, Clank would already provide the implementation for most of the built-ins, not only for our backend, but also uh, for other backends. And the, backend will, the backends would only need to lower the newly defined uh, intrinsics. We could here reuse our current group and table gen based uh, built-in lowering. The backend in the current form uh, targets the, the compute flavor of SpearV and supports the OpenCL API. Uh, though it should be relatively easy to add support for other compute APIs, um, we tried our best to make the backend as modular as possible since all the uh, SpearV capabilities, extensions, decorations, symbols um, are defined in table gen. And the same goes for built-ins they presented earlier. Now it is important that uh, adding support for 3D shaders or, or Vulkan, 3D Vulkan, would require much broader changes and then put uh, additional restrictions uh, in place on the generated SpearV. For instance, it would be necessary to introduce the op selection merge or uh, op loop merge instructions. And uh, upstreaming the backend was a, was a challenge in itself, but upstreaming and, and maintaining the backend in tree are two different things. Uh, to ensure the backend works as intended and adheres to the SPRV and OpenCL spec, we have developed um, over 200 lit tests for testing offline compilation for the backend. And additionally, we also provide a public runtime testing infrastructure based on the Kronos OpenCL uh, CTS or conformance test suite and uh, Intel graphics compiler. So if you make any changes to, to the backend code base uh, or global ISO, you can see the runtime testing results at a dedicated website. Uh, it's pv-testing.kronos.org. You can also download dumps and then try to reproduce some of the issues if there happen any. The current runtime OpenCL testing yields uh, approximately 87% pass rate in debug mode and 92% uh, in release mode. Uh, we have also compared uh, the performance of the backend generates code with, uh, with this PUV translator, and it looks to be on pair. Though the backend supports uh, optimized IR. So apart from the ongoing changes uh, in the backend I mentioned earlier, our current priority is to reach full OpenCL conformance uh, by the end of this year and subsequently uh, make the backend a permanent or non-experimental target in LLVM. And I think now we are ready for uh, questions. Thank you. So, so thank you, Mark, uh, Alex. So any other questions? Mike, on both side. Uh, thanks for a nice talk. Um, does, does having a spear V backend also mean we will get like target transform info for spear V at some point? Because that right now is something that's lacking. Um, 
having target transform info for a bunch of optimization passes or the infra address space pass, um, which tries to query information from target transform info. We don't have like a general target transform info for SPV. Are you planning on adding that, or is it already in? So uh, I'm not sure if you mean just uh, general optimizing transformations, which we, well, you have all the opt optimizing transformations which are in LVMIR, and you can utilize these. Um, we found those to be relatively more effective compared to the uh, SpearV opt that's available in SpearV tools. Uh, we are not planning on adding any uh, just SpearV specific optimizations into the regular pipeline as for now. Uh, but well, if there's anything that could be possible to do here, maybe we could just add these uh, before Cogen. Um, but well, we, we don't have anything planned yet. Though uh, what we found is that actually the optimized, so either O2 or O3 code uh, seems to be much more, uh, seems to have much better performance compared to uh, the opt optimized code. Yeah. Hi. Uh, uh, so I have a question regarding the test uh, infrastructure you had. So you mentioned about the Intel graphics compiler as the backend, right? Uh, so Intel, the open source Intel graphics compiler uh, is part of the Intel runtime driver that's available for Linux. And uh, inside Intel graphics compiler uses the LVM, well, the Kronos LVM SpearV translator. Uh, so what we did here is we replaced this translator and with our backend. So given that the pass rate for the Intel graphics compiler with the Kronos translator is 100%, we should also see the same with, uh, with our backend. So uh, we are using this as a, as a runtime, as, as a driver for, uh, for running the open CLCDS tests. And comparing the SPEAR-V coming from the translator and the backend makes it easy to spot any differences which may cause uh, some errors in the runtime. So uh, a question is, uh, this backend, right, is meant for OpenCL use cases yes. right now? And you also talked about, uh, you know, we can in add instructions, right, to the, uh, to the intrinsics, which are intrinsics, which are already there, right? We can uh, extend intrinsics to that. Yes. So if you want to say, you know, test for GLSL. Yeah, well, then you would need to add some other testing infrastructure. The, the so current testing infrastructure is just for OpenCL, the runtime testing infrastructure. So then would it go into the... So it will need, uh, in all of those boxes, it showed three boxes, right? Okay, if you can move back to that slide, I guess. Yeah, so, uh, so I guess uh, you mentioned about this lit test, right, in the LLVM repository. So if we have to do something for, say, HLSL or GLSL, uh, where the output is a spirit, right, then we will have to, uh, you know, have these things also done, right? Like, these are not, I believe we do have some lit tests which uh, test some GLSL built-ins as well. So, we, but is it exhaustive, or we'll have to like if somebody wants to? It's not exhaustive. We do. We have about a hundred GLSL built-ins. Uh, it's just a more of a uh, trying to show how to add them. Oh. But we have exhaustive list of open seal built-ins. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So our next talk was in five minutes. Thank you.